Welcome to eCancer TV. We are here in Lisbon in 2015 at the prostate debate uh, meeting. Uh, we have several experts here and uh, we would like to address some of the points discussed in this, uh, in this meeting. So first my question uh, is actually on the imaging uh, possibility and um, um, the imaging in prostate cancer has two key uh, issues. One is the diagnosis of M plus and M0 disease in castration resistant prostate cancer. But we also had many questions from the audience on how to follow up these patients radiographically. What is the update on that? Okay, so traditionally we've done uh, bone scans for this. Um, the question that always comes up is how confident can we be that what is M uh, oligometastatic disease is not polymetastatic disease? And, what is M0? Uh, now we know, and several meta-analyses actually show this, that the bone scans are really not fit for purpose uh, mm. in 2015. And if it's a critical decision point, and it is in many instances, then we should use, be using more sophisticated techniques uh, or more sensitive techniques. And in 2015, that's probably um, PET scan, something like fluorocholine, or something that could be more affordable, uh, something like a whole body MRI scan. In my institution, we would use whole body MRI first. Um, if that's negative, say for uh, we're looking for M plus disease, then we might then go to choline as a second scan. So that's how we would look at it. So how is the follow-up of these patients? Because traditionally, and even in the latest trials, yes. the, the, the follow-up is with bone scan and CT scans. Um, yes. um, so how is the follow-up of these patients anticipated in 2015? Yeah. So that is also changing in our institutions. In fact, in the last three or four years, it's completely changed. Um, traditionally, as you say, it was CT scans and, and um, bone scans. And now we've, we follow with MRI scans. Okay. Uh, on a regular basis. Uh, this we do on a routine basis. Um, and this, this is to see in, in non-metastatic disease, if we are looking for metastases, for example, uh, patients coming up to salvage therapy, perhaps for biochemical recurrence in a non-metastatic CRPC uh, st setting, then we will follow with regular um, whole body MRI scans. Um, and if the patients have M plus disease and we're following chemotherapy or abiraterone or, or radium, we will often use whole body MRI scans to follow uh, when they are responding and when they are relapsing. Yeah. With the availability of these techniques also in my center, this is really a conversion what we made. What happened in, in Barcelona or in Lisbon mm -hmm. uh, on, this, on this aspect? Are you also changing that or you still use bone scan and CT scan because in the trials you have to well, uh, I think you you point uh, the real the real uh, problem. Uh, we still maintain bone scan and uh, CT scan, and the main reason probably is that uh, the approval of the different uh, drugs are based on clinical trials using bone scan and, uh, and CT scan. So we we uh, adopt this uh, classical way to follow our patients. And we do, depending on the, mainly depending on PSA doubling time, we, we pace the um, whole, whole, whole close. Uh, we, uh, we scan our patient every three months, every six months, depending on PSA doubling time. But uh, I fully agree that the future will not be bone scan and CT scan. And probably I, uh, I, uh, I think whole uh, body MRI could be even more um, more practical uh, in our institution will be totally impossible now a day because yeah. the availability of MRI mm -hmm. so but we we plan in the near future yes to be adopting right. some of these still in the most most of the centers still in Europe is still the case I think yeah, exactly. so just to go to the next uh, uh, question uh, uh, Antonio is it um, we've seen these trials in metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. Now we have run the trials in M0 castration resistant prostate cancer where diagnosis is important. But now also we have data that chemotherapy and even the hormone sensitive um, is important uh, and has its effect. So chemotherapy is moving to the hormone sensitive, but also these novel therapies are moving to 
an earlier phase in the latest trials initiated is also homosensitive. How will that impact uh, in, 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 in the near future and how long will it take that it has its place now? Well, um, the, that uh, trials are showing us that we are in a very unstable landscape mm -hmm. that is uh, really changing uh, year by year. But definitely it will change our practice. Uh, you have already mentioned, um, uh, let me start with um, hormone sensitive. Hormone sensitive disease, um, we thought uh, that um, uh, taxanes are, were only for castration resistant, and now we know that this is active. They are, these, these are active drugs on hormone sensitive. Um, now the point is uh, selection of patient. I, do, I think that the three uh, clinical trials, JTUV, Charter, and uh, Stampede, don't uh, give, us, uh, give us enough evidence that uh, hormone sensitive disease is, uh, is sensitive to, to, uh, to chemo, but I would say that not for every single patient. Nowadays, I will, I will adhere to the idea of treating those a high uh, of poor prognosis or high burden of the disease. What's the percentage of those patients? Uh, well, you think, uh, well, I have a good uh, good data because we have uh, in Spain we have um, data on that, and, and there are five percent uh, uh, metastatic disease at the di at the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Of those, are around uh, 50, 60 percent will be high burden. Mm -hmm. I mean that uh, for the full diagnosis uh, patient of, with prostate cancer, this is around 3% of the total mm -hmm. that, in my opinion, should go for hormone treatment plus docetaxel. That is, uh, that is uh, mm -hmm. the number at, the, at this point, and I think they deserve that, that treatment. You, you have also mentioned uh, M0 uh, patients. And, uh, and just before entering on M0, uh, for maybe for next year, 16 or probably 17, we will have a very similar uh, on a stampede. There yeah. is one more branch uh, similar to the, the one comparing ADT to the Cetaxel plus ADT, and this is uh, using abiraterone yeah. Yeah. or abiraterone in combination with uh, enzalutamide. That, that yeah. will give more information about uh, how to treat this. How many patients are already in that? Uh, uh, trial included a lot of patients. I think more than thousand patients that, already. That's it. Yeah. It's, it's very. It's a very important uh, branch of yeah. the of the study with more than hundred uh, thousand patients, and uh, and uh, is supposed to be for next year. In one year from now, okay. we should have the data, and that will give even more information for that mm. patients. And uh, now now going to M zero, uh, we have uh, three clinical trials. Two two of them. I would say very important using uh, enzalutamide or using uh, ARN uh, 509, in which uh, this uh, uh, antagonist of the uh, androgen receptor, and we will see. I'm, I am quite sure, and I will uh, that we will get a, an improved uh, delay on uh, yeah. on progression. So when is that expected? Uh, based on. Um, on phase two clinical trial, we should expect a delay around one year yeah. on the yeah. development of metastasis. I, I, I have not clear idea whether that will impact on overall survival, mainly because of the different uh, lines of treatment that mm -hmm. we will get afterwards. But that will be a very important uh, issue yeah. also in how to treat our patients. Yeah. So, 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 Luis, we had vigorous discussion here at the prostate cancer debate mm -hmm. on what treatment to give on a, on a patient we presented. We have several options for castration-resistant prostate mm -hmm. cancer, and we still have options after each other, like mm -hmm. the sequencing. There's a lot of discussion there. Yeah. Um, what is your main message from that discussion yeah. on castration-resistant prostate yeah. cancer? I think uh, what really we can understand in our days is that we have new information about how to treat prostate cancer. We have new options that we didn't have before five years ago. The, all these new options are valid, and the patient is just one, and is not going to use just one of the options. So every, I think the, it's important that we do the exercise every time that you're going to decide for a patient. Is, okay, what is my best, best first option, and what will be the following one? 
So we have to, to, to look for the full package, not only for the first, first decision. And that, I think, will be more and more relevant for the future. And the full package can change with the advent of new trials with new results. So most probably from one year from now, you may be thinking about providing new options for the patient, as just Antonio just said to us. Now we have to combine that, which is coming from the clinical trials, which is the aim of every oncologist that is precision medicine. We would like to know what is the best treatment for the patient right now. So we need to have more information from the basic science, from the translational science, to bring us more information regarding tumor characteristics and patient characteristics, then we can decide better what will be the, the, the option. So apart from the fact that visceral meds is an exclusion criteria, yeah. for, for instance, radium-223, yeah. what is influencing the, the decision on chemotherapy or abiraterol or anzalutamide? Because they are all recognized yes. to be effective. You're right. Both either chemo, either abiraterol, either anzalutamide can be very effective in metastatic prostate mm -hmm. cancer, custom resistant setting. The question is, if this patient will need chemotherapy at any point, what is the right window to do it? Is right mm -hmm. at the beginning, or should we move that forward after average round? And I think this is we don't have the right answer for that. We can try to dig a little bit on the clinical trials, look for the characteristics of the patients. Until now, I will say that for those patients that have short period of response to uh, hormone deprivation, those patients that have extensive disease and symptoms, those are the patients that we must think upfront if you're not going to lose the window for giving them, them chemotherapy. Besides that, I cannot go further until we have more precision medicine. You, you think in 2017 or 18 we will have different opinions, Antonio? I'm, um, I'm, to I'm totally sure hmm. that uh, this is uh, moving very, very fast. And when receiving the new data, we are changing our practice. I see uh, the data from Charted and Stampede is a clear, hmm. a clear example of that but um, definitely um, the new drugs like uh, abiraterone and salutamide, and salutamide or new antiandrogens like uh, ARN 509 will move earlier on M0 disease mm -hmm. probably so this is a very changing uh, landscape. Peter doesn't this bring out this whole issue of timely readouts right because if we're going to base these decisions on um, volume of disease or the duration of response, then we're going to need better ways of monitoring yeah. disease. Yeah. And, that's fact, key. and PSA is not going to cut this, yeah, that's and that's why we're going to need imaging. I would like to have a metabolic evaluation of right. the tumors. So now we you think it's possible to have metabolic or molecular imaging uh, in the future? We, we, we know about uh, PET scanning possibilities there. Well, exactly. So if you, you can I mean, we've already got metabolic imaging with a non-specific tracer like fluorocholine. That's mm -hmm. a plain metabolic tracer, nothing more than that. So, and it's not very specific, but actually in terms of the total burden of disease and how it's doing, it's actually quite a good readout. Uh, but we will have more specific traces as well. So, for example, we can anticipate FDHT, fluorodihydrotestosterone, which is an AR receptor marker to okay. be able to inform on the total burden of disease that expresses androgen receptor compared to the total burden of disease in the body. Heterogeneity. Correct, okay. and that tells you about heterogeneity. And that sort of thing will be able to inform on whether, you know, do you go for an AR axis inhibitor or do you go for a more non-specific uh, chemotherapy type uh, treatment as well. Yeah. So, so the, um, uh, the imaging as a follow-up once again, is yeah. there is also necessity, and we we we've okay. seen that that you yeah. can see what is the what is the prognosis of an early response measurement yeah. apart from PSA or apart from mm. all the traditional imaging. Uh, yeah. uh, is that something feasible? Are there are there um, investigations in that direction? Yeah. So these investigations are just starting. What we've been doing is we've been working towards up until now, development of techniques. So for the last five years, we've been developing techniques until they're optimized. And we think we are now ready to be 
now used in, in the manner that you yeah. just described. So we're at the moment working on an MRI document, which will come out middle of next year, uh, or the early part of next year, which is a recipe. I said, this is why we should be doing imaging, and you've just said it, right? We want early readouts, we want more timely readouts, we want disease burden assessments, because it's all yeah. prognostic. But if you're going to use this technique, this is how you should do it. This is the technique, mm -hmm. this is how you report it, this is how you communicate. So these the standards are now going to come out very shortly. Apart from the imaging, uh, Antonio, is there something from the molecular field that we can fine tune um, the expectation for response of abiraterol or uh, anzalutamide? Well, I, I think imaging is going to be very, very important. Uh, probably whole body MRI can, uh, can give us a very good idea about the response, even in the size of the metastasis for progression or reduction of size. But definitely, uh, I think the um, biology will get a very, very important role in the, in the near future in order to select the, the which treatment for, for which patient. Uh, CTCs, uh, there is uh, a mm -hmm. lot of work on CTCs and I think molecular uh, mole molecular profiling of CDCs yeah. can give us a very good uh, clue about, uh, for instance, AR expression and whether this is more susceptible to, to respond yeah. to, to new drug uh, hormone therapies or whether we should escape from those and going directly to cytotoxic drugs. Okay, thank you for your information on this exciting topic actually. A lot of things are happening, a lot of data are gathering and uh, we will definitely have a different view next year.